We heard the passage of the, uh, the gospel this morning. It's about the parable of the wicked vine dressers and the vineyard and the vine dressers. Um, this passage recounts the entire story of Israel and their relationship with God. In few, few words, the entire story of Israel and the relationship with God. This passage is mentioned in the three synoptic gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, in Matthew 21. Let's see if I can probably move this a little. Okay. That's too cool. In Matthew 21, Mark 12, and Luke 20, this passage is read. In short, the parable is of a landowner, someone who owned the land, and planted a vineyard, and hired servants to take care of this vineyard, and left. Then he sent servants <clears throat> to collect fruits from this vineyard, and the hired servants, um, the hired farmers rather, killed them. Then he sent his own son, the hired farmers also killed him. Then he took his vineyard from them and gave it to other farmers. That's pretty much the story or the parable of today. This parable is not something new to the, to the audience. The audience were the um, Jewish religious leaders, the scribes and the Pharisees. They've heard this before. In Isaiah chapter 5, I'll read to you almost the exact same passage that we just heard this morning, was also mentioned in Isaiah chapter 5. It says, My well-beloved has a vineyard on a very fruitful hill, and now, O inhabitants of Jerusalem and men of Judah, judge, please, between me and my vineyard. What more could have been done to my vineyard that I have not done in it? Why then, when I expected it to bring forth good grapes, did it bring forth wild grapes? And now, please let me tell you what I will do to my vineyard. I will take away its hedge, and it shall be burned, and break down its walls. And the very last verse says, For the vineyard of the Lord of hosts is the house of Israel. So here our Lord is doing the commentary, or Isaiah is doing the commentary on this parable. Let's define our characters and go over some explanations of the verses, and then application, what's in it for us. So, the characters of this parable. First, the owner is God. The owner of the vineyard is God. The vineyard is Israel. The vine dressers are the religious leaders of Israel. Those are the vine dressers that were hired by the owner. The servants that came to reap the fruit are, who are they? The, the, exactly, the prophets throughout the um, Old Testament history, the prophets that came to reap the fruit. The harvest that is to be reaped is the fruit of righteousness that the Lord wanted to reap out of this vineyard. The Son, that's easy, the Son is the Lord Jesus Christ, the Son of the living God. The other farmers that came, who are they? the apostles, and the rest of the disciples, the church. Now let's go over a few words in the passage, a few verses to um, further explain. The verse that says, verse 14, it says, When the vine dressers saw him, they reasoned among themselves, saying, This is the heir. The heir. Come, let us kill him, that the inheritance may be ours. What's interesting here is that the vine dressers, the wicked vine dressers, realized and recognized that this is the Lord Jesus Christ, the son, the heir. The heir as in the one who will inherit. They recognized him. They knew him. But why did they not bend their knees to him and worship him? Because they were filled with pride. They wanted to keep the inheritance for themselves. They wanted to keep the governance for themselves and not let that be for the actual heir, the Son of God. St. John tells us in John 12, Among the rulers many believed in him, but because of the Pharisees 
They did not confess him, lest they should be put out of the synagogue. For they loved the praise of men more than the praise of God. It is their pride that even though they recognized the Lord, they did not want to worship him. This reminds me much of, much of like um, today's atheists, those who reject the existence of God. His fingerprint is all around you. The evidence is all over the place, pointing to the existence of the very true God. Yet no one wants to bend their knee, those, some of the atheists at least, who recognize that no other explanation for the, uh, the creation of the world, the creation of life, the creation of the moral values and all of these things, no other explanation is given other than the one true God. Yet they do not worship and they do, do not bend their knees to him because of their own pride. Then it goes on to say, um, they cast him out of the vineyard and killed him. That is a prophecy. They cast him out of the vineyard. This is a prophecy about Christ um, as he was killed outside of Jerusalem. Do you know why Christ was crucified outside of Jerusalem? Because he was our sin sacrifice, or he was our sacrifice of sin. If we go all the way back to the book of Leviticus, I believe chapter 4, there were five sacrifices of the Old Testament. There were types to the antitype who is the Lord Jesus Christ. One of those sacrifices was the sacrifice of sin, Zabihat al Now, what was the um, unique feature of this sacrifice? Is that it was sacrificed outside the temple. Why is that? Because it bore on it all the sins of those who were offering it. People who would offer this sacrifice, kind of like similar to the sacrifice of trespass, they would put their hands on the sacrifice and transfer their sins onto it. Therefore, because it has all these sins, it was sacrificed outside the temple. Our Lord Jesus Christ is also our sacrifice of sin. St. John, I believe he said, Behold the Lamb of God who carries the sins of the world. So he put on himself all of our sins, became our true sin sacrifice. That's why he was offered, or I should say he offered himself outside of Jerusalem. And that's why on... Uh, Good Friday during Holy Week, we go um, worship and uh, carry his reproach using St. Paul's expression outside the temple because Christ was crucified outside the temple. So this was also a prophecy. They recognized who he is and Christ prophesied about his crucifixion. Then Christ asked a question and it's in Matthew. He said, therefore, when the owner, he asked them a question. He said, when the owner of the vineyard comes, what will he do to those vine dressers? Now, if, you, if you're the audience and Christ is telling you this story, what do you think he would say? They responded and they said, He will destroy those wicked men miserably. He will lease his vineyard to other farmers or other vine dressers who will render to him the fruit in their seasons. What did they do? They judged themselves. They became a subject, or they became subjects in their own story. Christ wanted their heart to convict themselves, their heart to convict them. And if you remember back in Isaiah, as we read in Isaiah, um, verse three, chapter 5, verse 3, it says, And now, O inhabitants of Jerusalem and men of Judah, judge between me and my vineyard. So this was already recorded in Isaiah. He actually uh, materialized it in um, the passage. So what was the judgment? Two things, destruction and displacement. Destruction, which took place in the year 70 AD by Titus, the destruction of the temple of Jerusalem. And the displacement here is taking this vineyard from the original farmers and giving it to other farmers. Who are these other farmers? The Gentiles, us. Those who are outside of the uh, nation or the uh, um, Israel. And Isaiah says also in chapter 6, Foreigners shall be your plowmen and vine dressers. Other people will be grafted in this vine. The Gentiles, that is what he means by that. 
So this is just a brief overview of the, um, the passage. Now, what's in it for me? What's the application? Now, this is great. We understand the passage, the landowner, the vine dressers, the wicked vine dressers, the vineyard. Who are we in this passage? So what are we? Are we the vine or are we the vine dressers? Are we the farm or are we the farmers? What do you think we are? Both. We are the farm and we are the farmers. We are the vine or the vineyard and we are the vine dressers. How are we, much like the parable of the sower, Methalizera, we are the sowers and we also are the soil. Of course, the seed is the word of God. But we can be in one sense sowers and we can be in another, another sense the soil. Just like this parable. We are in one sense vineyard and we are in another sense vine dressers. How are we vineyards? We are the new vineyard of the Lord, of the New Testament, the church. In this sense, we are the recipients of God's grace. We are the recipients of God, God's grace. And we sing a beautiful hymn in the liturgy, the Aspasmus Watos, Ayuha Rabb Ilah al It says here, O Lord God of hosts, return, look down from heaven and see and visit this vine and the vineyard which your right hand has planted. That is no coincidence that this is the psalm of today's gospel. If you remember the psalm of today's gospel, it's So we are the new karma, the new vineyard that our Lord now is tilling, plowing and cultivating. And that is, as I said, the psalm of today's reading. How are we vine dressers? That we know we are the recipients, we're the new vineyard, the recipients of the grace of God. How can we be vine dressers and farmers? Um, not only are we recipients of God's grace, but more importantly, we are stewards of that grace unto others. We are much like conduits of this grace unto others, others around us here in the church and generally speaking in the world. So here is a practical example. We all pray and we say, our dear Heavenly Father, grant me your peace. We say, our dear Heavenly Father, grant me your love, your joy. How often do we pray and say, our dear Heavenly Father, make me an instrument of peace unto others or make me an instrument of joy and love and mercy. Only then will we become farmers, not just a farm. So we take the grace of God, the blessings of God, the peace of God, the joy of God, the love of God, and what do we do? We transfer that, we convey that to others around us. So when people see us, they will be filled with joy. Imagine if you just walk into a gathering and this gathering all of a sudden becomes a joyful gathering because of you. You filled this place with joy. And this is when you become a vine dresser. You become an instrument of joy. So not only are we receiving, but we are also conveying and giving. But for us, for us to be flowing with joy, peace and love, we must be filled only when the cup is filled it overflows but we're not filled enough we're not going to overflow so we ask the lord to fill us with his joy to fill us with his peace to fill us with his love so that we can overflow unto others i'll give you um, a, a, another example um, the difference between physical possessions and spiritual possessions Physical possessions, that's a different kind of math. A math that multiplies by dividing and uh, adds by subtracting. Very difficult, different kind of math. Material possessions, when shared, they decrease in value. If I have $20 and I share my $20 with one of you and I give them $10, I will end up having less money. Unlike spiritual possessions and spiritual virtues, when shared, they increase in value. 
So when I have peace, and I share this peace with others, I will end up having more peace. If I have love or joy and share that joy with others, I will end up having more joy. So spiritual possessions operate very differently than materialistic possessions. May our dear Heavenly Father grant us all to be not just a farm, a vineyard to be cultivated, but to be vine dressers, farmers, to cultivate and transmit this joy unto others. Glory and honor be to his name forever and ever. Amen.